Well, good morning again. Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 24. We're in a series called Stories. And uh, we started it last week. Pastor Aaron started with uh, the parable of the sower. And really what a parable is, is just a practical story that introduces a biblical truth, a spiritual truth. And so Jesus used a lot of those to help people understand what he was talking about, right? You got to put the cookies on the lower shelf so people can understand, you know, what he's saying. And so Pastor Aaron, again, he started last week with the parable of the sower. And I'm gonna give a quick recap of what he shared because there's a correlation between what he talked about last week and what we're gonna look at today with the parable of the weeds. And the correlation is there's a farming illustration. Uh, there's a sower in both uh, these stories that Jesus is talking about, and there's an implication uh, that he utilizes this kind of agrarian society uh, that these Jews are living in. And so in the first part of Matthew 13, uh, you have a sower who is going out sowing the seed, and that seed goes into a field, and depending on what type of ground it hits, it responds differently. And so the first illustration that Jesus gives is the seed falls on the hard ground, the, the hard soil, and it, and it can't penetrate. Therefore, the seed can never grow and, you know, and do anything. And so that illustrates the person who basically just has the hard heart, who is skeptical about God, who just thinks all this is a bunch of fairy tales and doesn't really ever, you know, believe in Jesus Christ. And so therefore, they never become a Christian. Secondly, the seed falls on what is known as the rocky soil. And the rocky soil is where the seed gets in and there's a little bit of nutrients there. And so the seed sprouts up, you know, real quickly, but because there's not enough nutrients, it quickly dies and, and fades away. And that illustrates the person who maybe comes to church and is initially excited about God and feels like God is gonna fix all their problems, right? He's gonna be the genie in the bottle and whatever they ask for, he's gonna wham, give it to them and life's gonna be okay. And then as you know, they realize not too far after that that's just not the case. Life still has its challenges and its difficulties. And that person too falls away. Though they may go through the motions, they never become a Christian. That third seed falls into what is known as the thorny soil. And in the thorny soil, there's weeds that are there that choke out the ability for the seed to grow. And that illustrates the person who, they may love church. They may be here all the time. They're friends with everybody. They think all the programs are great. Um, but in all reality, they're more in love with the things of the world. We live in a world with a lot of good temptations, a lot of things that distract us. And this person never really becomes a Christian because they're more caught up in the things of the world than they are in who Jesus is. So then lastly, there's the fourth soil. It's the good soil. It's the soil where the seed falls, it germinates, it grows, and leads ultimately to a harvest one day. That's the person who truly becomes a Christian. They're the ones who hear the words of the gospel and believe and respond. And so uh, as we look through these, uh, I like the fact that, you know, Jesus uses these, you know, kind of farming illustrations. I mean, after all, we're in Lakeland, Florida, and if you've been here for any length of time, maybe a little bit of time, but if you grew up here, you know there's a strong citrus industry here. There used to be a lot of orange groves. Now they're becoming houses, but there used to be a lot of orange groves everywhere, and if you're over in Plant City, you know you got the strawberry festival and stuff like that. So we, we kind of can understand these farming illustrations. I mean, I like yard work myself. I don't know if you like yard work. Some people are thinking yard and work are two words that should not go together. Like, as long as it's green, it's good, right? So I just see it when I pass by. It doesn't really matter or what it is, but, but I like working out there. Maybe you're like this, you know, like getting out there and, you know, mowing the grass and making sure things look good in the flower bed. Like you like going to Home Depot, right? Or Lowe's, either one, I'm good either way. Like it's your happy place, you know? You go there on the way, like my wife wonders, why do you go there every weekend? I, it just draws me, I don't know, just, you know? But there's, if you like yard work, you find aisles and aisles of things with fertilizer, you know, you got St. Augustine grass, you got to get Scott's bonus S and, you know, or you got weed killer or insecticide because you don't want those chinch bugs getting in there. And so, you know, you can spend hours down there looking through all the different things, but you want to come back and, and work in the yard so that grass is green. And, you know, you want to look like you're on the cover of, you know, Southern Living Magazine, right? The neighbor drives by, looks at your yard and goes, wow. And you're like, yeah, just doing my thing out here. Right? So, 
So yard work. So now you kind of get what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about farming illustrations. And uh, so we're going to pick up Matthew 13, verse 24. And this parable is really kind of broken into two parts. We're going to read the first part, which is the story. And then we'll look at the second half, which is the explanation. But in verse 24, he says this. He put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. So what do we see in this part of the parable? Well, first, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven. He uses that phrase, the kingdom of heaven, which is important for us to know what he's talking about. You know, so often in our lives, even as Christians, we're focused on what's got to be done today. You know, we're focused on our world and our activities, who's got to be picked up and delivered where and what's got to happen. And, and we don't often think about eternity. And Jesus says, we're focusing on the kingdom of heaven here. But to the audience that he was addressing, it was really important. Because remember, this Jewish audience, they were waiting on the Messiah to show up. They lived in, under Roman occupation. And so they were hoping the Messiah was going to come as this conquering king and take out all the Romans so they could set up their own kingdom and live the way they wanted. And Jesus says, no, my kingdom is not geographical. It's not political. My kingdom is spiritual and eternal. My kingdom is different. Mine is the kingdom of of heaven. So when you become a Christian, you become part of the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says right up front here, that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about my kingdom. And so he says, there is a farmer sowing some seed. Um, you know, in order for seed to get in the ground, somebody has to intentionally go put it there. It doesn't just show up automatically. And so this farmer is doing what most farmers do. They're going out and they're kind of wanting to produce a crop. And so he's going out, this farmer's going out and putting his seed into his field. And notice that there is a field. I'll talk more about what the field is in a few minutes, but just know in order to have a crop, you have to have a field to put it in. And so this farmer's out there working his field. And what happens? We discover that there is an enemy. Now, evidently, it was a well-known practice in this day and time that for one nation to try to stop another nation, when it came to warfare, one of the things they would do was kind of a form of bioterrorism. One army or one group would sneak in and put, throw weeds into the agricultural crops of the other nation. Thus, if that nation couldn't produce a crop, then their soldiers couldn't eat. And if you can't eat, you can't really fight. So one way of stopping one another was to sabotage each other's crops, um, kind of a bioterrorism, if you will. And so it wasn't just related to warfare. It also kind of showed up in commercial activity. Like if one person had a business and the other guy's business may have been doing better, he might go try to sabotage this other person's business by throwing some, some weeds out there in the crops to mess him up so he could get ahead. Matter of fact, it was so bad, the Romans actually established a law against casting weeds into somebody's field. It was criminal behavior to do this. And this audience, they knew that. They're like, oh, yeah, we understand how that goes. I mean, it even happened among neighbors. Somebody would go out there, and they're just starting throwing, they're mad at their neighbor, throwing some weeds in there. I'll mess him up, show him his boss around here. And so there was this whole thing going on. So this audience was well aware of those type things happening. Now, the problem was the kind of weed that was being used is known as darnel. See, they were trying to grow wheat, and there's this seed called darnel that looks almost identical to wheat. Matter of fact, in its seed form and its early growth, you can't tell them apart. They both kind of sprout up green and lush, and it's not until the harvest time that you can tell the wheat from the darnel. The wheat, as you know, you've seen it, you know, it's kind of that, that golden husk. It's got these 
large berries and you take those and you grind them up and you make flour and make bread and, you know, make something to eat out of it. Well, the darnel, when it harvests, when it gets to that point, it has a small kind of a grayish berry that's really useful, useless. It's not good for anything. But what's actually worse about darnel is it's a poisonous seed. Uh, the Bible dictionary says this about darnel. It said, if it's unidentified and gets ground up with the wheat, it says, when darnel is ground into flour, baked into bread and consumed while hot, someone eating it may experience symptoms similar to drunkenness, tremors, the inability to walk, hindered speech, and vomiting. In addition, darnel is commonly infected by a fungus. This fungus is known as the ergot fungus. And if you consume those, it can create hallucinations and in large doses can damage your central nervous system. The Greeks and Romans actually said of Darnell that it could lead to blindness. So this is a bad weed. This is a bad seed. When somebody starts throwing Darnell seed into your crops, they don't like you. They are not your friend. They are the enemy. And so they knew that. They understood that this was a bad situation. But you don't know it early on because they both look identical to one another. So you don't know it until it gets to the harvest. And that's what happens in this story. And so suddenly they're getting to that point and the servants are out there in the fields and they're getting ready to harvest the crops. And they're like, uh-oh, we got a problem. There's weeds in the field. And they go back to their master and say, hey, master, didn't you plant wheat in the field? We got weeds out there. I said, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to start ripping them all out and pulling those weeds out? He said, no, the wise farmer knows this. He knows that because the wheat and the darnel are very similar in structure, their roots can actually kind of grow together, that if you rip one out, you damage the other. To damage one is to destroy both. So the wise farmer says, no, you just got to leave them there. Let them grow side by side because he knows one day there'll be a harvest. At the harvest time, we'll separate the good from the bad. We're going to cut it all down then. You can gather up all the bad weeds. You can go throw them in the fire. You know, you can get all the wheat and you can bring that and put it in the barn. It's, it's going to be okay. So he tells them, don't worry about it. It's, it's going to be all right. Now, what I want you to notice here is that there's only two types of plants in the field. There's only wheat and weeds. There's not some third type of crop growing out there. So you're either one or the other. You're either wheat or weeds. And so Jesus is teaching them this story, and then he kind of takes a break, and he's going to head back to the house. Now, they had been teaching in a place that today is known as the Sower's Cove. It kind of comes from this time frame. And the Sower's Cove um, is on the Sea of Galilee. It's not too far from Capernaum. And in Mark's gospel, he tells us that when Jesus was there, that Jesus probably got into Peter's boat and pushed out a little bit from the shore. That's where they were along the seashore there so that he could speak to the audience. It's kind of a, a natural amphitheater, had great acoustics. Um, I've actually been there. It's a really incredible, beautiful place. Uh, we've got a group going here in a couple, matter of fact, three weeks from today, well, we've got a group of 55 heading to Israel. If you've never been, I encourage you to go because it brings these stories to life. Jesus really taught these stories to a real audience uh, and there are lessons for us today. And so they're at this place and Jesus goes through a variety of parables. Matter of fact, two of the parables that are in this part of uh, chapter 13, we're not gonna get in today. One of them's the parable of the mustard seed. The other one's the parable of the leaven. And both are great stories about the impact that we can have in our world um, as we live out our faith as Christians. And so, but for sake of time, we're gonna kind of jump past those um, and get into where the explanation of the story is. And so Jesus, after preaching for a length of time, kind of comes back in and says, all right, I'm heading to the house. And they probably go to, to Peter's house. And so we're gonna pick back up in the explanation, which is in verse 36. And it says here, then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers. 
and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. If you got ears today, you need to be listening, right? And so what does Jesus say? I'm so thankful for the disciples because they ask the questions we're all thinking, right? I mean, Jesus shares this story about farming and most of them were fishermen, but they could understand some basic farming, but they had no idea what that meant for their spiritual life. You know, I mean, we get some of that. And we're like, okay, Jesus, I mean, I know, I understand the, the farming thing, but what does this mean for me? Like, how do you want me to live out my faith with this? And so I don't know if it was Peter or John or one of them, but one of them said, can you just tell us what you're talking about here? And so he does. So for the benefit of those guys and the benefit of all of us, Jesus explains the parable of the weeds. He says first, let me tell you who the farmer is. He says, the farmer is the son of man. And the son of man is a title that Jesus commonly used for himself. He used it because it illustrated his humanity and his humility, the fact that he was God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us. The Jews associated that phrase, the son of man, with the coming of the Messiah. So Jesus is telling them here, hey, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one you're looking for. The sower is the son of man. That's me. And so they began to realize who he was. And he says, all right, the sower is working his field. And so the field is the world. Now, some scholars like to think that the, the field relates to just the church. And the reason why they think that is because there's an enemy and the enemy is trying to destroy God's field. And so we know the world is full of sin, right? And so we kind of think, well, the church is where God's people are. And so if there's an enemy, he's going to attack the church. But here Jesus says, no, no, the field is everything. It's everyone. Because after all, God created everything. This is his world. He says in 38, this is my world. And in verse 41, he actually says, um, it's about his kingdom. So he ties it all together that what he's talking about is the whole world. He's talking about everybody. Now there are times like in John 12, 31, where Jesus refers to Satan as the ruler of this world. But really that's more just a reference to the influence that he has temporarily, you know, because he does have a major influence in the world in which we live. But it's definitely not a long-term title. It's something that will soon pass because God is establishing his kingdom. And one day, Satan will be gone. And so I don't want you to be confused when you see like, Satan's the ruler of the world, but this is all of God's kingdom and field. God's in control. We live in his field, in his world. And um, now certainly the church is gonna be impacted because after all, the church exists in the world, right? So if Satan is trying to impact the world, he is going to impact the church. Thus, we are going to see weeds in amongst the wheat. We're going to see weeds in the church. Now, before we get into talking about that, let me tell you the good news of this side. It's, uh, the good news is the good seeds refer to the, uh, to the sons of the kingdom. And I love that phrase, sons of the kingdom. If you're a Christian, if you've made a profession of faith, you're a child of the king of kings. Your future is secure. You are going to be okay um, because anyone that's placed their faith is a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. You're a child of the king. Now, there's a difference in this parable between the good seed and the parable that Pastor Aaron talked about last week. Last week, when Jesus was sowing the seed in that parable of the sower, the seed is a reference to the gospel itself, the fact that he is sharing the good news of how somebody can become a Christian and there are different ways people respond. This time, he's talking about the good seed actually is about those that have already become Christians. In other words, the good seed he is casting out into the world. And so what we find the context in this parable is it's a missional theme. In other words, God is sending us out. If you're a Christian here today, you're here with a purpose. God is sending you as his ambassador into the world. We're supposed to live sent. We're supposed to go out and be lights in darkness. Uh, Pastor John MacArthur says it this way. The Lord plants his people in the world as his witnesses to grow and become fruitful plants of righteousness. Christians are not placed in the world by accident, but are placed here on divine assignment, divine assignment from the Lord. MacArthur goes on to say, the primary purpose of the good seed in the world is to make converts of the weeds. 
we all started as a weed. That's where we all began. And somewhere along the way, if you're a Christ follower, you chose to become a Christian. And so for those of us that are Christians today, our job is to go out and share with those that need to know, those that need to hear the good news of the gospel. So there's a missional connotation to what Jesus is talking about. Matter of fact, another theologian, his name's Frank Stern, stated about this passage, you can kind of see three themes in this parable of the weeds. The first theme is this. There's a missional focus highlighting the purpose of the good seed. Secondly, there's a Christological focus highlighting Jesus as the sower of the seed. And third, there's a spiritual warfare focus highlighting the weeds as an attack of the enemy. So speaking of that spiritual warfare side, the seeds of the enemy, let's turn our attention there now. Just like Jesus has his followers, Satan too has his followers. They're referred to here as sons of the evil one. Now, we can't recognize them all. Remember the wheat and the weeds look alike. After all, it's not real popular to run around wearing red and horns and a pitchfork, you know, that can just kind of stick out when you do that. It's very subtle. And I would even say most people that are sons of the evil one don't even know it. They don't even, they're not even aware that that's who they are. After all, you probably did not consider yourself a son of the evil one before you became a Christian, right? You didn't think you were a Christian, but you didn't say you lined up with Satan either. I mean, most people that are out there, I mean, they're probably not members of the church of Satan out spray painting churches all the time. They're just people that are unaware. But the reality is there's only two types of people. Just like there's two types of plants, there's only two types of people. You're either a son of the kingdom or a son of the evil one. You're a child of the king or a child of the evil one. Question is, which one are you? So when it comes to the weeds, I think you can probably categorize the weeds into two groups. Uh, one is those that are and don't know it. Second is those that are and don't show it. So those that are and don't know it really is kind of like what Pastor Aaron talked about last week with those other kinds of soil in the ground. That person that's that hard soil that just refuses to believe in the word of God, just refuses to believe the gospel, you know, if they don't ever become a Christian, guess what? They stay a son of the evil one. They don't get to be neutral. You're either one or the other. So if that's that hard-hearted person who just thinks all this is foolishness, that's the end result. You stay a son of the evil one. That second person who, you know, came to church, got all excited, thought God was going to fix all their problems, mend all their needs, you know, they're going to pray a prayer and God was going to bless them with a million dollars or, you know, fix whatever's broken. And that didn't happen. So they threw their hands up and said, well, God didn't work either. Well, they don't just stay neutral. They stay a son of the evil one. You're one or the other. Third person, you know, the one that's in among the thorny soil you know, captivated by the world and all the things that are out there that twinkle and sparkle and catch our eye. They stay sons of the evil one. It's only the one that receives the gospel becomes a Christian, becomes a child of the king. So there's a lot of people out there that are sons of the evil one that just don't recognize it. Jesus tells us this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Jesus says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. There are weeds, there are people that are weeds that just don't know it. They're just kind of living life thinking everything's okay. You're either one or the other. But then yes, there are weeds who know it and don't show it. There is a subversive group of people out there that actually desire is to damage the church. Those are weeds who have an intent to destroy what's going on in God's field in God's kingdom. Satan loves to masquerade, doesn't he? He loves to masquerade, loves to hide. What's masquerading? That's putting on a false face. 
concealing who you really are. And so if Satan can do it, certainly those or his followers do the same thing. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 14 through 15. He says, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Light is representation of Christ. Disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. So not everyone who calls himself a Christian really is. Now you might think, that sounds crazy. Like it's not popular to be a Christian. Why would somebody call themselves a Christian and really not be one with the intent to do something wrong? Because there's spiritual warfare going on. You see, Satan takes this very seriously. His desire, according to John 10.10, 10, this says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. As we're kind of casually going through life, as sometimes we think about church as like, what am I going to wear on Sunday and will there be donuts there? <laughs> Satan's thinking, how can I wreck your life? And he's not playing games. And neither are those that are his servants. You know, we think the Navy SEALs, and they are, you know, an extremely clandestine group. But they got nothing on the Prince of Darkness when it comes to secrecy and submersiveness and sabotaging things. There is an enemy. Hear me on this. There is an enemy that wants to wreck your life. That's all he thinks about. It's all he wants to do. It happens every day, all day long. We cannot live oblivious to that, that there are weeds out there with an intent to destroy. If Satan has no problem walking into God's throne room, I mean, read the book of Job, then he certainly has no problem walking into our church or walking into your home. Doesn't scare him. Now, there's only one of him, and he can only be in one place, but there's a whole lot of weeds out there. And their desire is to ruin things. And so, yes, in this room today, in a group this size, there's weeds in here. Christ tells us the weeds and the wheat are going to be side by side. That gives you a whole new perception of church on Sunday morning, now, doesn't it? Some of you are like looking around, kind of going, who am I sitting beside? But it's serious. It is a serious issue that there is an enemy whose desire is to destroy things. And what are we going to do about it? You know, for some of you, it might be like, that's kind of scary to think like that. You know, you don't have to be alarmed. God's in control. For others, it just might make you mad. Like, that's so wrong. You know, I knew there was hypocrites in the church. You know, we get rid of these people. If you're in that company, join the crowd. Remember the sons of thunder, James and John? I mean, they wanted to call down fire out of heaven to burn up all the hypocrites in their day. Like, can't we just get rid of all these people? Jesus is like, chill out, boys. It's all right. I got this under control. The reality is, he says, you're just going to have to wait till the harvest. You just got to be patient. Yes, you're going to come to church and there's going to be weeds in it. You know, you said, that explains why people act the way they do, right? You know, I always wondered about that person. Now, sometimes we get into talking about church discipline and things like that. And church discipline is a good church practice. We see it in Matthew chapter 18. But church discipline, the purpose of that is to help we wheat that's struggling get strong. It's not about kicking weeds out. The purpose is to strengthen those that are Christians. Accountability, the purpose of accountability is to help Christians be stronger Christians. Some of us, though, get caught up in being spec inspectors, looking for all the flaws in everybody else. That's not your responsibility. Just like the master told his servants, don't go pulling out any weeds. You just leave them be. Your responsibility is you be the best Christian you can be. You be the fruitful wheat God has called you to be. God knows who the weeds are. They're not fooling him. He'll take care of them. He tells us that eventually there's going to come a time when the reapers will come. So in verses 39, again, we'll read through that again. It says, uh, 39, the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. 
Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The good news is, for those that are believers, the harvest is coming. When Jesus said God's going to send out his angels, they associated that with end times. Oftentimes, that's what they saw. God would utilize his angels when the end times drew near. And so when he says, hey, at the harvest, I'm sending out the reapers. The reapers are coming. They are coming. There is a future when the reapers will come and the harvest will take place. They're going to separate the good from the bad. Those that are followers of Christ from those that aren't. And it uses this phrase here for those that are weeds that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, there's a difference between plants and people, right? You knew that. You burn plants up, they're gone. You get rid of weeds, it's nothing left. With people, there's a fire that will never be quenched. There's an eternity separated from God. Weeping and gnashing of teeth refers to this. Weeping illustrates great mourning and sorrow. You've probably bought something at some point in time and had buyer's remorse and felt bad or made a bad decision. You're like, ah, why did I do that? There will be no remorse, no mourning like there will be on that day when you were separated from God for all eternity because that's not a decision you can undo. There will be great weeping for all of eternity for those who rejected the gospel. And there'll be gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth means great anxiety and pain. It's a fiery torment. God didn't create hell for people. He created it for Satan and his demons. But when we reject the gospel, we refuse to become a Christian, that's where we put ourselves, separated from God. Now, the good news is the harvest hasn't come yet. The reapers have not been sent out. And God loves you. God wants you to become a Christian. He wants you to get saved today. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let today be the day of your salvation. If you're sitting here today and you've started to realize, hey, I might be somebody that's not in God's field then at the end of this, sir, I'm about ready to finish up in a few minutes. You come forward and talk to one of our pastors, one of our leaders, and you talk about what it means to become a Christian. Don't worry about your pride or your ego or feeling embarrassed or anything like that. It does not matter what anybody else in this room thinks. It matters what God alone thinks. And so today, if you're here, know this. God loves you. He desires for you to become a Christian, and you can do that today. You can become a Christian, have your eternity secure today. Jesus ends this parable by saying, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. He quotes there from Daniel chapter 12, verse two. Daniel says this, and, uh, and those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. As a Christian, your future is bright. You're going to be okay. Why become a Christian? Because you're going to be okay. Why tell somebody about Jesus? Because their future matters. Yes, right now, you live among the weeds. Right now, it can be tough. It's difficult. There are people that treat you wrong, that act wrong, that don't do the right kind of stuff. I get it. This life is difficult. And to you, God says, hang in there. Hang in there. The harvest is coming. You're going to be all right. I'm going to come. I'm going to get you. I'm going to take you to my barn, and you're going to be all right. For all eternity, you're going to be okay. So just hang in there. Pick your head up. Keep moving forward because i got a purpose for your life. i got a purpose for your life right now. You're not just going through the motions. So as we wrap up, there's three things. You can kind of change this on your outline. I changed it on Thursday mornings. I kept praying through and studying through this. It says on your outline on the paper one, it says that there's 
uh, two promises and one command. You can kind of cross that out there, you know, modify it. Um, I wrote, I came up with three new ones. And uh, because I'm a, I'm a pastor, you have to alliterate everything. So it's three Ps. But uh, uh, there is a purpose, number one. There is a purpose. There is a perpetrator. And there is a promise. Number one, there is a purpose. As Christians, your job is to be fruitful and multiply. Wheat is fruitful and multiplies. It provides life. Our job is to provide life in the world in which we live, wherever you are. This past Sunday, my wife's car died. Like engine, kaput, gone. So I ended up at a car dealership. Exciting place to be, right? If you're a car dealer, salesperson, thank you. (laughs) But there I was, shopping for a new car. And people ask you, right? You've been there. So what do you do? I'm a pastor, but I'm thankful for that opportunity. I'm thankful for that question because it opens the door for me to talk about Jesus. And so there I was able to share with with the audience I had what it meant to know Jesus because I have a purpose. You have a purpose. Our purpose is to live sent, to go and share the gospel. The Great Commission says to go into all the world and make disciples. You're not just casually coasting through this world. If you're wondering, why did God put me where I am? Why, do, why is this stuff going on in my life? Know this. God puts you in your family, in your neighborhood, in your job or place you go to school, in this city, in this country, on purpose. You are here by design. And that purpose is to be on mission for him. You are his ambassador. You are here to be light in darkness. So live out your purpose. We have these cards on the crosses. Last Sunday, Pastor Aaron had us come forward and write a name of somebody that needed to become a Christian. And so many of you came and wrote down those names and we prayed for them this week and we put them up on the crosses. Today, we're gonna give you the same opportunity. If you weren't here last week, you can come. There's baskets that are down front. You can take out one of those cards and you can write a name or multiple names on that basket. If somebody that you know needs to become a Christian, and then put it back in the basket. Don't try to attach it to the cross. We'll do that during the week. But we'll, we'll take those cards and pray for them as a staff. We did that this past week. And many of you, hopefully you're praying for those too. But, but we're looking forward to the day that those people get saved. How exciting will it be when we baptize somebody whose name is on one of those cards right now? Won't that be awesome? So live on purpose. Live your life with purpose. Secondly, yes, there is a perpetrator. He is a shadowy enemy constantly seeking to destroy God's world. We need to be alert. There is a roaring lion seeking to destroy, to devour who he can. The good news is, the Bible says, if you resist the enemy, he will flee from you. So if you're struggling today with what to do, you just say, Satan, get behind me. I need to know Jesus today. But let's be alert. There's real spiritual warfare going on. Let's not be casual in how we approach our Christian faith. Let's live it out. The promise is this, the harvest is coming. It's kind of a twofold promise. Number one, yes, the weeds are gonna be burned up. There's a punishment for weeds. What you need to know this, here's the gospel today. I'm gonna share it with you real quickly. Romans 3.23 says this, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All means all, all of us, everybody in here, we've all sinned fallen short of the glory of God, missed God's eternity. But the good news is this, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While you were a sinner, Christ died for you. Christ died on the cross so you could have eternal life with him. You don't have to get your life perfect before you become a Christian. He died for you as a sinner. Just come receive him today. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. That's that fire. But the gift of God is eternal life. That's going to the barn. John three sixteen, probably the most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes should not perish, but have everlasting life. How do you do that? Romans 10, 9 tells us, you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. You stop being a weed and you become wheat. You can do that today. I'm gonna pray here in just a minute. You get up from where you're sitting, come down front, we'll be down here. Remember, don't don't 
please don't think about what somebody else is thinking about you. Think about what does God think about me? May today be the day of your salvation. And for those that are Christians, be encouraged. The wheat will be rewarded one day. There's a good future in store for you. If you're a Christian, maybe you want to come down front, two-part invitation. Come down front, you fill out one of those cards. So let me pray for us, and then I invite you to respond. Let's pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we thank you for this parable. Lord, it teaches us some important truths. One, that as Christians, you've called us to live life on purpose. So I pray that we would all, as believers today, go out of this place on mission. We live sent into this world to be your ambassadors so that other people might respond to you. Lord, help us to be mindful there's a war going on. We gotta be careful who we associate with. But may we not be fearful. May we be confident as a child of the King that we're okay. And Lord, we know that the harvest is coming. And I pray today that before the reapers come, that those that need to respond to you will do so. May we, may somebody become a Christian today. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' most precious heavenly name. Amen.